So welcome back everyone and thank you for joining us for this session on mobilising vocational education and training transitions. My name is Paula Johnston. My business is called Skills Think Consulting. TDA have a very small secretariat, so I have the pleasure of working with the team as an extra set of hands uh, for special occasions and for special projects like this. Um, as we might have some new audience members joining this session, I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connection to land, sea and community. I'm joining you from Turbal country in inner Brisbane. I pay respect to elders past, present and uh, extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples participating with us today. I'd like now to introduce our presenters for this session. Um, firstly, we have Dr. Sharon Shembury from, uh, the, from TAFE Queensland. Sharon is the Dean of Higher Education. Dr. Ben Allett, Dean of Higher Education College from the Chisholm Institute and Mish Eastman, Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Vocational Education and Vice-President of RMIT University. You can find out more about um, each of them from their profiles on the Zoom events site. We'll hear from each of our presenters for 15 minutes each and I'll keep time for them, I'll help to keep time, and then we'll have a chance for questions at the end. Remember, if you have questions um, during the conversation, use the Q&A, not the chat. The chat is good for uh, making comments between yourselves, and that helps us to manage the questions at the end. Closed captions are available during this session. If you need them, just turn this feature on. So uh, it's time to hand over to our first speaker, Dr. Sharon Shembury the Dean of Higher Education from TAFE Queensland. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you very much, Paula, and thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, okay, right. So um, I've been in higher education uh, for more than 25 years in Australia and in the US, but I've been at TAFE Queensland for the past 20 months. And one of the appeals in coming to TAFE Queensland for me is the potential that I can see with VET to higher ed pathways. Um, the title of the presentation today for me is VET to higher ed, an organic approach. And of course, you know, I'm indicating there my idealism. And of course, reality is 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 somewhat different. I'd like to also acknowledge traditional custodians of country and pay respects to elders past, present and future, recognising that teaching and learning has taken place on country for over 60,000 years and two-way learning is an important part of our reconciliation journey. All right, so let's set the scene here. In the broader context, we've traditionally had a hierarchical tertiary education sector. And in recent years, as um, we've seen some universities stepping into the vocational space and similarly, some vet providers stepping into the higher education space. And effectively what we've currently got is multi-layered governance and funding structures. Now that challenge we'll leave with the university's accord and Jenny Macklin, <laughs> um, but we do look forward to uh, seeing that final report that's due in December. Um, with the emergence of dual sector institutions, we're, we're, we can also observe increased diversity in student cohort, for example, um, across the uh, core equity groups, and I'll talk more to that in a minute. But we, we can also see increased di diversity in terms of program design and delivery. So uh, effectively, we do have the opportunity for increased flexible learning pathways, but it's also our current challenge. And generally speaking, we need to adapt with better support to achieve the uh, intention of equity and inclusion. And that's actually part of the 2030 agenda from the United Nations and their sustainable development goals. Oops, right. Okay, so um, along the same lines, but higher ed specific, the emphasis on widening participation 
um, it, it is not only a national priority, it's actually an international priority. And we see with the university's accord um, emphasizing equity and as access in that regards. So we want uh, our underrepresented minorities, for example, to have the same opportunities, equitable opportunities in terms of coming into higher education. And, and with regards to access, what we're talking about there is entry criteria, um, uh, making, making it so that uh, there is equal opportunities for access. Most Australian university students come in with an ATAR score out of high school. With uh, So that's 43% are going into university with an ATAR score. The thing is that um, uh, underrepresented minorities don't necessarily get an ATAR. And, uh, and this is part of the educational disadvantage that we see um, it, across these core equity groups being specifically people from low socioeconomic backgrounds, Indigenous students, people with disabilities and those from non-English speaking backgrounds and not to neglect our regional, rural and remote students. So with regards to Indigenous students, 68% um, may complete high school and get an ATAR, whereas comparing that to 91% of non-Indigenous students will complete and, and take an ATAR on their way to university. That's 2021 figures there. Okay, so we see VET to higher ed pathways as um, a, a viable mechanism to widen participation. But when we when when we look at what that actually is, um, it's quite complex. Pathways can be direct or indirect. They can be multi-stage. They can be across the sector. They can be within the sector. They can be one way. They can be two way. They can be single disciplinary or they can be multidisciplinary. The point is, is that they're complex. We've, we're dealing with multiple stakeholders. We're dealing with a high level of variation across institutions. And effectively, we've got a diversity of learning trajectories. So from that, we can identify, we can state that VET to higher ed pathways are rarely the product of rational choice or linear process. We can also recognise that they're an essential element of social justice. There's mechanisms in place to support VET to higher education transition. We see it with government policy and funding the Higher Education Participation and Partnership Program, the HEP funding, provides um, Table A institutions uh, so that it's to support strategies that are designed to improve undergraduate um, courses for people from the regions and remote areas, but also low socioeconomic backgrounds and Indigenous uh, students. So, so the HEP funding is designed to improve retention and completion rates. We also see the Bridges program, federal funding, 21.2 million went to five institutions, including that, that collaborated in, and that collaboration included TAFE New South Wales and uh, University of Western Sydney, UTS as well. They developed several hundred pathways and uh, their funding also was designed to build student confidence and uh, knowledge about um, studying at university. Also, support processes were built into that funding. So that's at the government level. At the institutional level, we see policy designed to support VET to higher education transition. Um, uh, the thing is that we have to balance it with student support strategies because without that, um, the funding or the intention uh, doesn't go where it needs to, doesn't achieve the outcomes that it needs to or is designed to do. So I'm, I'm emphasising the point that vet to higher education transitions are complex. And so we have to understand these complexities better than we do, because as several people pointed out in, in the earlier sessions, vet to higher education transitions and pathways has been around for more than 20 years, and yet we've made little progress. And, and I'll talk to some of what's happened um, along the way just shortly. 
In terms of barriers, we see variation in institutional policies with regards to recognize, recognition of prior learning, credit transfer, advanced standing. We also see differences in the approaches between BET and higher ed with regards to how to do teaching and learning, how to design assessment. And some of the cultural differences we can recognize include student to staff interactions and relationships. There's also tangible evidence in, in, in policy and procedure. Um, and then, you know, at the juggling study work and family commitments that can look quite different in VET as opposed to higher ed. The Bradley Review in 20, 2008 identified that there was an increase in domestic VET to higher education transitions from 5.8% in 1994 to 10.1% in 2006. NCVER 2012 data told us that 7% uh, of students entered higher ed with a completed VET qualification, and then there was another 1.4% that came in with an incomplete VET qualification. The graph that I'm showing you here today comes on this slide, figure 27, comes from Universities Australia 2022 report, and that's telling us that um, the proportion of first year domestic bachelor students admitted on the basis of secondary education declined from 50% in 2008 to 43% in 2020. And in that same period, uh, students admitted on um, with, with prior higher ed or VET qualifications, whether they were quick, complete or incomplete qualifications, that increased from 33 to 40%. 33% in 2008 and then 40% in 2020. So, you know, there's there's some evidence of good things happening, but um, we've got a long way to go. Here, this is case-specific data published by Alice in 2018. They documented um, uh, the situation for a particular university in Sydney from 2010 to 2014. They had 18% of commencing undergraduate students coming in with a VET qualification. So we're talking about 9,650 students. And here's the breakdown on this slide, 11% with a level six, 17% with a level three. And interestingly, it was concentrated, 60% of those 9,000 students were concentrated across these specific disciplines. Alice also tells us in terms of attrition that um, uh, for commencing students with um, coming in th through a VET pathway, their attrition rate is 13 times greater than the mean institutional attrition rates at this particular institution at this particular time. So there was 43% attrition for VET pathway students as compared to 3% for, for total students. Um, there's a story there. Uh, and, and it harks back to the cultural differences that I flagged just earlier. It harks back to the complexities that I flagged. With regards to retention, that, that's a, a, a nicer looking story, but it varies and it varies across disciplines such as law um, doing better with retention of their pathway students than non-pathway students. And um, education, it's the other way around, the VET pathway students at 83% compared to 88%. So one of the things that Ellis states is that commencing VET pathway students are significantly more likely to have difficulties transitioning to degree studies. Um, okay, no revelations there, but then what do we do about it? I mean, what's missing? We've got the government support, we've got funding, um, maybe not every day, but you know, the, the it has been there in the past, I'm sure it'll be there in the future. We've got sector support across the VET sector, across the higher education sector, tertiary, um, university sector. We've got institutional support. We can see that in terms of pathways management. At TAFE Queensland, we have a, a pathways manager um, who, who does an excellent job. And, and at the industry level, they're supporting this pathway transition as well because um, they want skills-focused graduates with the bachelor qualification. So the question is, what's missing? Well, Smith, 
um, along with Jack Frawley and Christine Robinson, big names in this area of research in 2017, they um, they focused in on um, identifying strategies to improve vet to higher ed transitions. And this was this work was funded by the National Center for Student Equity in Higher Education. And they identified that it's complicated, even for mainstream students. Um, it's more complicated for the core equity groups, but for mainstream. And why is that? Because it's poorly promoted. There's a low level of awareness. So the total number of students making the transition remains small. And then that low level of awareness is particularly relevant for, for example, for Indigenous students. Um, so their research focus was actually on Indigenous learners. And what they reported is that Indigenous students, they consult their peer groups, you know, friends and family. But of course, misinformation abounds and uh, they advocated for investment to build on real life experiences for st Indigenous students and staff. And uh, they also recognised, acknowledged that vet to higher ed is a viable pathway option for Indigenous students. Okay, good work. Barbara and Nethton, I really like what they published in 2018. Um, uh, they focused on um, the impact of a, a vet qualification and taking that into the higher ed context. They acknowledged that vet to higher ed transitions are indeed an established component of Australian education. And that's a good thing because it provides access to those who would otherwise be excluded from university education. The key elements that they are identifying um, uh, uh, the vet educator's role, you know, part of what um, they are reporting there is students talking about, you know, my vet educator, my vet teacher, they believed in me more than I believed in me. And, and that's what got me through to in the university beyond vet. And um, building the student's confidence along the way is part of what um, uh, impacts whether or not they complete. But the big thing to me, uh, Barbara and Netherton in 2018 are reporting, is that essentially the student perspective in terms of vet to higher ed research is largely missing. So we have to ask the question, what is the vet to higher ed student experience and how do we document it? Well, I'm advocating a research design and uh, it's a focus on student experience. It's a multi-methods design that combines macro level stats, trend analysis, regression analysis, combined with a micro level student decision-making focus where yes, we study mainstream students, but we deliberately target the core equity groups. And um, that work, uh, hopefully, the National Centre for Student Equity in Higher Education will agree that it's a good idea and they'll give me some funding so I can do this work in collaboration with James Cook. So TAFE Queensland and James Cook working together is a great combination to make this happen because TAFE Queensland is a leader in the vet to higher ed pathways. We have 16 university partners across the nation and we um, uh, promote 550 pathways for students to articulate from vet to higher ed. And JCU is going to help us out with regards to remote and regional access too. So Sharon, there Sharon, you go. Sharon, it's Paula here. I'll just give you a time check there. Oh, okay, Paula. Keep going. Oh, no, I'm done, darling. Oh, you are done. That, that's <laughs> your last slide. Oh, that was, <laughs> that was How's that for timing. Does that work, Paula? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I was giving you a time check because I thought you were going to go a bit longer. Never mind. That's great. Thank okay. you. Uh, the uh, The message that I heard loud and clear there was that transitions are complex. Obviously, they're very complex. But one thing that um, is staying in my mind is that they're rarely the product of rational choice. I like that. It kind of tickles my um, sense of humour as well. Thank you, Paula. But, and that's exactly why we have to study student decision making, you see, because none of us yeah. are rational. We're all irrational, including our students. Correct, correct. Yes. Thanks so much, Sharon. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Ben Orlett. 
and he's the Dean of Higher Education College at Chisholm Institute. Um, I'll let you take the floor, Ben. Thank you, Paula, much appreciated. And thanks TDA and others for the opportunity to speak today. Can I just get confirmation that I'm showing the presenter view rather than the other view? No, that's the other view, Ben. How's that? Um, there you go. That's better now. Excellent. Fantastic. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, my name is Ben Ellett, and um, I'm going to be talking about enabling student transitions through vocational to higher education by looking at educational and social changes that we might be able to implement across both the sectors to facilitate that transition. Uh, Chisholm, before I start, Chisholm acknowledges the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional custodians of the country on which all of our campuses are located. We recognise their continuing connection to land and waters and thank them for protecting the country and its ecosystems that we enjoy today. And we obviously pay our respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to all First Nations people. So today I'm going to bring up a few points. I'm going to first talk about some of the barriers that many of us will be aware of in that transition from TAFE to higher education. I'm going to highlight the fact that there is actually a, a glaring lack of evidence for any real implementation of teaching and learning change to either sector to facilitate the change or the transition from VET to HE. I'm gonna talk about using articulation as design and how we might implement that in future course design for these transitioning students. I'm gonna talk about how we might use human capital to provide momentum for transitions and facilitate that articulation. And I'm gonna provide some recommendations which I need to emphasize on my own um, and not um, representative of anyone else. So most of us here would be really well aware that when the AQF were implemented in 1995, it really enabled us to be able to map those pathways to higher education and make a comparable education system across both the VET and HE sectors. And we could basically say that if you have done this work at a diploma level, then we're basically going to allow you to articulate and recognise that learning, apply credit, etc. Now, in theory, what this has done for us is it's allowed students from non-traditional HE back, uh, backgrounds to enter higher education and to gain all those social and vocational benefits that we know come with having a, a degree. However, the reality is, and Sharon brought this up well before, that there's some real burdens that, um, that stop that transition being as successful as it could. And we know that those are financial for students, travel and attendance issues, work-life um, balance issues and the list could probably go on and on. So if you ask anyone in a TAFE higher education provider setting or a dual sector set, um, university, we'll tell you that the pathway from vocational to higher education is really simple. And we tell students complete a degree, a uh, diploma and enter the degree of your choice. But the reality of the situation is that they may only receive limited credit. There may be a certificate for prereq for the diploma that the student wants to do. The diploma may limit the ability to enter other disciplines, and that's certainly the case if it's not a cognate discipline. And we know that students go immediately from that competence-based teaching and learning approach to a self-directed and assessed model. Now, we use this figure that I've included here, which is logical and intuitive to me to represent those pathways at Chisholm. But it is quite complicated when you look at all the entry and exit points. And so we all, while we all understand it quite well in the sector, actually expressing that pathway to other stu to students and potential students in particular is, is quite complicated and I think they find it difficult. So we know that there are inconsistencies um, in the approach to teaching and learning that occur in both vocational and higher education. And the differences have been argued to lead to disparity in the levels of progression and completion for, um, high, for TAFE entry students. We know that despite coming to higher ed with lower levels of numeracy and literacy, our TAFE or vocational entry students are unlikely to seek academic support. We know that fewer students complete degrees when they enter from vocational entry than their school entry peers. And the academic and literally literacy issues that are faced by those vocational entry students create a poor perception of higher education learning. In fact, we have many students that arrive through diplomas to our degrees at Chisholm, and they have no 
appreciation, or I shouldn't say it like that, awareness of the differences that's required in that learning space. And they exit really quickly when they see what's required or what we're asking them to do in the first instance or hit a crisis point in which they may actually seek out that academic support. And if we're lucky in that instance, it's not too late. We also know that non-attendance of a traditional first year of higher education course can disadvantage students through a lack of exposure to those cultures of inquiry and introductory subjects, which when done well, introduce students to writing skills, research skills, report writing, numeracy, et cetera. And we know as well that when those students that coming from a vocational or TAFE uh, background enter large cohorts of students, often the disadvantage and that those lower levels of numeracy and literacy are hidden by joining existing cohorts. So, while there's a lot we really know well, what we have done, and I may ruffle some feathers here, is we've really looked at the transition from vocational to higher education from an operational standpoint. And we've asked ourselves, where is the credit? And I have to admit that I've done this. Academics will pedantically sit there and they'll look at the um, uh, the levels of competency that come from a diploma or we'll map them onto learning objectives and we'll say you get credit here you don't get credit there we say which diplomas will lead to which degrees and there's a whole bunch of evidence as well that says if we um, introduce students to support programs like the uh, Logan tertiary access program that they are more likely to succeed we also say potentially go into a cert four in tertiary preparedness but what we're essentially doing is adding another hurdle, we're adding another financial burden, and we're adding time uh, to these students who are already telling us that those are hurdles for them to do well in higher education. What we haven't looked at well is how we embed support for literacy and numeracy, and I'm not saying just in diplomas, but in both sectors, in the higher ed and diplomas and uh, vet sectors to make that transition better, how we can uh, develop similar approaches to our delivery and assessment across both the sectors to ensure that the transition is smoother um, and how we can embed that support and um, acceptance, I suppose, uh, for self-directed learning strategies across both the sectors to ease the transition as well. So it's been argued, and I do like this quote, that that transition from vocational to higher education is hindered by the depth and detail of subject knowledge, pedagogical approach and assessment, and the level, genre, and independent nature of academic research and writing that is required. We know that this is also particularly relevant for those from low socioeconomic backgrounds and those from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. We know that the TAFE approach and vocational education ap approach to learning is far more structured than the higher education approach, provides really clear learner outcomes for students who may find that self-directed model of learning a little bit more difficult. And we know that moving from that competency, repeatable competency-based assessments um, to high stakes pass or fail assessments that are often not scaffolded well also leads to poor outcomes for students. And those of us in the higher education sector, we all like to say that we scaffold our assessments really well, but honestly, we probably need to have a, a good look at that as well. Now, the early experience of students in any tertiary setting is a, a determinant of their success. And the greatest attrition for both the vocational and higher education sectors occurs in the first year. Um, and the social integration and academic performance are obviously predictors of that attrition. We talk about developing de um, desires for lifelong learning to ease the transition from H uh, TAFE to HE, but what we really need to start thinking about to do that is to develop some consistencies in both the social and academic practices that are going to provide those better air learning outcomes for students. If we start to do that and have a consistent approach to both the educational and social needs of our students, then students who enter from a diploma into a higher education course are not gonna feel like they're doing their first year of study for a second time at a different or the same institute. So we're gonna find it difficult to find, find the balance between necessary and stimulating content. Um, James in 2010 found that a quarter of all first year students don't find their course stimulating at all. And, a rate, and that is a rate that's really similar to those students who do not finish their courses. And we also need to be aware of the, those consistencies that we might develop in the way that teaching staff would interact with their students and deliver content, um, support their students, uh, make sure there's no staff hostility. Um, and we need to make sure that the teaching modes lead to students leaving, um, hate, don't lead to students leaving HE uh, early. 
So I'm going to start arguing here that I think that all of this is really possible and that we can integrate some uh, similarities across the sectors using models of capital. Um, and using these models, we can start to think of articulation as design um, and not as an afterthought for these courses that we all deliver. And when I say articulation as design, what do I actually mean? I mean that we think about where students come from, where they're going. We think about what the educators in both the sectors are doing. We start to create students who see themselves as successful learners. Now, we actually developed a course um, based on the foundation degree model in the UK in 2020. And it's our Bachelor of Psychology, which is an articulation only degree. And we designed it from the bottom up that you could only enter with a diploma. So we went to Texa in the first instance and we said, here's a, a reasonably novel model to education that we'd like to propose where all students do a diploma for the first year as part of their three year study program that leads to a bachelor degree. Now, Texa came back and accredited that and that was fantastic. They recognized that it was an ASQA accredited first year and they had accredited the second two years of the program. Now, a psychology degree in Australia is pretty useless without the Australian Psychology Accreditation Council accrediting your degree. And we went to them as well. And part of this articulation as design piece was that to make sure that we could meet all the foundational competencies that APAC required, we included them in the second and third year. So a student could come from just about any diploma and still meet the um, professional body accreditation requirements and go on to become a clinical psychologist, researcher, et cetera. So I think redesigning articulation into a model that suits a trajectory rather than an abrupt transition is where we need to start looking. So trajectories in education look to build momentum um, through the entire educational sector, not just one or the other, not vocational education, not higher education. And they do that by um, recognising in the first instance human, human capital, and this came up in an earlier speech. When diploma students enter higher education, we recognise the skills and technical knowledges, knowledge that they come in with, um, and we help then leverage that to do well in higher education. We need to develop social education for students transitioning. So we have networks, contacts and relationships that last through the transition from diplomas to higher education. We need to develop cultural capital, so cultural knowledge and embodied co um, culture, again, that lasts across the transition. We need to build psychological capital in both sectors so that students feel resilient, they know they're adaptable, um, and we also need to build identity capital. And this goes back to that lifelong learning. We need to build that foundation of who am I across the entire educational journey where students see themselves as successful learners. So that human capital model basically means that when these vet students come into higher education, as the higher edu as someone in the higher education myself uh, sector myself, we need to start recognising the technical knowledge that they bring with them into the sector and not just say you come with, a, with lower levels of numeracy and literacy. Instead, we need to build on the skills that they bring and build up that momentum so that they feel that they're really integrated into that second year, which is their first year of HE study. And we need to make sure that there's an understanding in both vocational and higher education that the ability to acquire, acquire and use knowledge is still embedded in that VET curriculum um, and that we definitely scaffold our education in higher education better to, to make sure we're suiting the needs of our vet entry students. So I think, and we I'm sure we all know, we can actually do this quite well. And if we understand what students from diplomas come with into their higher education degrees, then we can scaffold our education far better. We know that if we maintain small class sizes, um, provide individualised feedback and support, then the skills that students come with from their VET quals can be enhanced and built up into those more complex levels of learning. And I've got an example here of a single student who came to our Bachelor of Psychology um, from a Diploma of Counselling. Um, and on the left, I've got a, an assessment that was done in week one. And on the right, I've got an assessment that was done in week 12. And this isn't a criticism at all, but these vet students came to our higher education program with um, very low levels of uh, numeracy and didn't know how to calculate an average. We scaffolded the program so that in week one, they're doing simple histograms. And on week 12, which is the figure on the right, the same student is doing null hypothesis significance testing by hand on paper. That's a 12-week program, 12-week class that this student has been able to 
um, build up their mathematical skills and we're required to deliver those skills um, to have the APAC accreditation. It's certainly doable. We also really need to start looking at the um, development of social capital across the transition. Um, it, it drives social mobility. So we know that social ties are really effectively established when students have access to others with more resources and knowledge. Now, even in the TAFE higher education sector at the moment, we don't do this as well as we, anywhere near as well as we could. We need to make sure that those social ties between higher ed students, vocational students, higher ed teachers, vocational teachers are established, encouraged, and um, built up through the entire educational process. It doesn't matter if students decide not to move on to higher education, it's absolutely fine. It'll just help them through the diploma phase of the educational education piece anyway. But this social capital is done so well in the university sector, and what we need to do is start building that up in the TAFE higher education sector and the vocational sector as well, so that these students are getting the same social benefits that their university peers are. Um, universities offer cultural capital really well. They've got social life and events, community engagement, student leadership roles, shared interest clubs. And this obviously leads again to the increase in social capital. They're building those bonds and they're lasting over the educational journey, helping those students stay. stay. So we need to start doing this in the vocational and HE sectors as well. We need to do it well. We need to develop shared opportunities for cultural engagement. Um, and this is obviously likely to lead to changes in disposition of both, across both cohorts of students and staff. And again, we're going back to building that momentum for this trajectory from transition to VET to HE. And we're, and we're easing the burden for those transitioning students. They're not feeling like they're in the first year again. They have a cohort of students and teachers that they already know. Um, and lastly, in my recommendations for changes in education that can actually really facilitate this change, we need to align um, the expectations of personal investment across both the sectors. There is really a stark difference at the moment in the requirements for self-directed learning between vocational and higher education. And that the research certainly indicates that the bridging courses and support works when we, we transition students across. However, I strongly believe that there is a consistent educational approach that we can use in both sectors and particularly in those two transitioning years that, where, that promotes self-investment, preparation and creates a vision of what the student wants to be. And this will obviously lead to improved in identity capital. Um, we've just started implementing a problem-based learning research project at Chisholm into our Bachelor of Community Mental Health AOD, and I've started implementing it into classes that I run at the moment. It's a great model that I think can be implemented really well into both sectors. And instead of the teacher standing up the front saying, this is what you need to know, memorise it, go and show me how you know it later, um, we assign a problem. We, the student identifies what they need to know. We work in groups, again, creating that social capital, um, and we learn to solve the problems that we're actually given. Now, this, I don't think, um, minimises in any way that diplomas are industry-based and need to meet those industry um, requirements for vocational skills, etc. Instead, I think we're just extending the thinking of our students beyond, in the first instance, competency-based education, but also giving them those skills to move on while, as, as I said, still meeting all the industry requirements that we have. So what are my final recommendations? Well, firstly, we all know what we need to do. do. We've talked about it for 20 years, but um, in my searches, in putting together this particular piece of this particular presentation, I did not find a single published paper that said, here was a change to pedagogical approach that we implemented in either sector that actually facilitated the learning of the outcomes for students. So we need to now get some empirical evidence that, for the things that many of us are doing and show that the approaches that we're taking to these transitions work. And we need to do that um, rather than just thinking about adding additional hurdles. Um, we need to approach the hate, diploma HT transition to recognise the skills developed in diplomas, and we really need to scaffold that course complexity in the second year. We need to introduce potentially teaching approaches such as that problem-based learning in both diplomas and higher education, and that'll ensure that students really know how to learn and feel confident in finding answers. Um, using models of capital will obviously help us do that, and we need to build those social and cultural bonds across the transition. High in the sky stuff, um, obviously a unified regulatory body to ensure that teaching and learning are consistent across both the sectors, um, or at least where they can be, would be brilliant. 
And it would be remiss of me to say that a model that allows students to stay at their current place of education through an equitable cost model, um, including CSPs for TAFE higher education providers, um, would certainly ease that transition for students and allow them to progress uh, better through um, that, what I'm calling now a trajectory. Excellent. That's great. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Thanks uh, so much for your presentation. We'll move on to our final speaker, um, who is Mish Eastman. Mish, uh, hello. And Mish is the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Vocational Education and Vice President at RMIT University. Thank you and welcome, Mish. Thanks, Paula. And just checking if you can now see my presentation screen. Uh, there we go. Excellent. That looks good to me. We can see in technology uh, works. That's always good. Yes. You might not be quite in presentation mode because I can see all your tabs at the top as well. Hmm. Don't know how to get rid of that, but we'll just uh, scooch around. Oh, and we'll go back to there. There we go. That's better. Excellent. Go ahead, Mish. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, as my colleagues did, I would like to acknowledge that we, I'm coming from the unceded lands of the Woiwurrung and Boomerang language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations here in Melbourne, otherwise known as NAM. And I pay my deep respects to Elders past and present and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues joining us today. So bridging the gap between vocational education and higher education, um, what I'm bringing to today's conversation is a dual sector voice. And um, I guess some of the ways that we, we have experienced and do see as dual sectors uh, where that where we can maximise um, for participants that educational um, and employment success. So who is RMIT? We have 134 years of deep history as a um, organisation based in Applied Outcomes in Melbourne. We started our uh, organisational construct as the Working Man's College of Melbourne. So what we do is deeply based in commitment to outcomes that lead to employment and impact for participants across the full spectrum from certificate programs through to PhD. We have nearly 100,000 students each year who connect with RMIT and of that, about 20,000 of those students are in my College of Vocational Education here at the university. Um, and that ranges from certificate through to diploma, advanced diploma and associate degree programs. So uh, I guess a couple of key elements that I'd just like to draw out is really building on the fact that the key theme I would suggest for maximising um, some of the experiences for learners and for stakeholders across the community, be that government, employer, civic responsibility, are really about inclusive by design and that co-funding is critically important. So what I'll step through today and feature are programs that have really involved committed employers and providers and government, and that that coalition is one of the critical ways going forward that we can um, really integrate that mid-tier solution and ensure that it is uh, not constrained by current Mm, let's say, training package or curriculum de design experiences, not constrained by current policy levers or current funding models. So that's the provocation that I'll bring to today's conversation. So uh, when we talk about um, the dual sector advantage and pathways at RMIT, uh, as I said, we have a, a deep experience in this space. So we um, continue to lead with regard to learners who come to us and continue with further study and further pathways articulation. Over the last few years, we've done deep work uh, within our organisation, really refreshing and modelling um, our pathway advantage. And critically, um, I think, to in sort of uh, echo the insights from my colleagues who presented earlier. It's crucial that that pathway articulation has real and guaranteed credit built within it. 
So requiring those who've reached AQF5, so a diploma level, to then go back to the beginning is um, effectively a mechanism for failure and setting people up to feel like they're double doing their work. So we've recalibrated our RMIT pathways and that includes making sure that we have established 74 vocational education to higher education pathways within our own organisation and more than 100 guaranteed VE to VE pathways. So it's a point of key difference for our students and for maximising their success in an embedded way. Um, one of the other element examples I would use is, particularly in our IT stream, for example, where students are able to build not only um, vocational competence, but also educational confidence throughout the way. So we have, in our, in our IT discipline, four qualifications within four years. So students can commence with us at a certificate for an IT level. They can then um, proceed to a diploma. They can then continue to proceed to year two of an associate degree. And then in fourth year, they can obtain their completing year of a Bachelor of IT. Each of those are exit points because we know the employment market is so hot for graduates in this space and they are deeply sought after. But if they then return, uh, you know, it might be in a non-linear way that they come back to us and that guaranteed credit ensures that the individuals undertaking our IT program can continue to um, accelerate their progression and combination of work and life and study. Um, Importantly, we know from the NCV uh, validated data and our own data, 30% of our students, as I said, have further related study as the reason that they choose us uh, and um, that we're well ahead of other NCV out, um, statistics across the sector. So we've done some deep work to understand what that means. And Importantly, it means that for this year in particular, we had nearly four and a half thousand students commencing across the university who have been VE pathway students. So some of those um, other obstacles and challenges with understanding the environment that you're coming into, the size, space and experience of being in a large university environment, uh, the clubs that are accessible, the support services that are accessible, et cetera, that I think Ben talked to in particular, have already been navigated by students being in the same institution for their vocational diploma experience. So their likelihood of being able to access those services has already been integrated into their vocational experience with us. So of those four and a half thousand students coming to the university this year, who've already had a VE experience, they about two, 2,300 of those are continuing with another VE experience. So it might be a certificate for to diploma or a diploma to an advanced diploma for a lot of our engineering students, for example. And around 2,000 of those students are going into our other higher education pathways and colleges. So it's a substantial proportion of our RMIT student community and brings with it that... Um, uh, important integration and also the fact that the type of learning that we emphasise and are moving to at RMIT, not only in our vocational education area, but also in higher education is based on flipped learning experiences, is based on problem-based learning and is based on um, demonstrating through application authentic assessment. So all of those uh, very tangible skills that vocational students undertake through their learning um, translate really nicely into second year of a degree. One example of that is our advanced diploma of engineering students. So of our graduates, 58% 50, um, of our graduates from that advanced diploma of engineering, um, of those, 100% of those graduates went on to study a Bachelor of Engineering Honours. So not just a BEng, but a BEng with honours. That gives us one of the quality indicators around the level of success that our students are having, which is at odds with some of the other research findings that, our, that my colleagues have presented earlier. And I think why that single um, organisational approach that we have at RMIT 
can be successful and there can be elements of that that are transferable to others across the sector. I'm going to race through because we're already at 20 past four and time is going to fly by pretty quickly. Um, I guess a uh, couple of things that I wanted to highlight. One is a model that we've used here at RMIT in the um, community services and health sector. So in particular, we've had a a agreement between the state government, between about 40 employers across disability and aged care, and also bringing in the unions and the participants themselves. This was a, a project that has delivered over a thousand workers into this very difficult to um, recruit for uh, industry sector. And it's also assisted um, pathway exploration for existing employees to upskill from a certificate level qualification into an advanced diploma in community sector management. So the themes around this have meant that we have over 400 new workers coming into this sector over the last two years of, of this existing project and another nearly 400 workers upskilling through what we've designed as the higher apprenticeship and traineeship for the social care industry project. And the themes and the elements that I think are crucial for us being able to change the face of education and respond to the accord include the factors of co-creation in this delivery model and recognising that linking earning and learning together with guaranteed work, so the participants being put on a formal contract of training through a traineeship, rather than them needing to undertake it in their own time or in a highly um, uh, casualised workforce model where all of the onus and the burden sits with the individual, has um, really assisted in the high levels of completion, retention and success of these participants. Because the workplace has invested in them and given them a, a fixed term on our ongoing contract, because the assessment is based on real work that students do, but also because the government has invested with us to ensure that there are workplace mentors who can travel across different employer bases to assist and um, with the support of the learning participants, but also with the workplace supervisors. They've been crucial ingredients to making sure that this project was successful. So it was co-designed. It was important to all stakeholders that it was nationally recognised qualifications. The workplace mentor model set it up for success. The onboarding and employment was a crucial bit about de, uh, making sure that casual burden was not there, financial burden was not there for individuals, but that there was guaranteed employment experience and that it was broad and deep over the life of the training for the individual. Now, dual sectors do a lot of collaborative work and we have responded to the National Accord with um, a number of examples. So I do want to call out that my colleagues at Victoria University deliver one of the largest integrated undergraduate programs in early childhood education and care, um, and specifically through the block model. So I think um, some of that limiting class sizes, ensuring it's carefully curated and looking at the pedagogical approach to make sure you set students up with that cascading element of educational success as well as educational and vocational competence is crucial for us when we are looking at adaptable models uh, to translate. So the, the VU model is a really exciting career opportunity approach that they've been able to look at that integration of vocational um, into a, a degree outcome as well, meeting the needs. You know, we've got a huge workforce demand here in Victoria with regard to workers working across um, all of the government initiatives from kindergarten uh, through to expanded school environments. Federation Uni as well in Western Victoria have worked with their local government authority um, to really look at resolving uh, a skill shortage with regard to um, professional occupations in civil engineers, town planners and building surveyors. And the similar themes around ensuring you've got the voice of the employer, the 
imagination and expertise of educational design and thinking about where you can take away those burdens of finance, time and multiple pressures on the learners, I think, are crucial. And look, seeing that Paul has connected in, I think it's probably time for me to wrap up. Um, but the, the element I would say is that we, as a group of six dual sectors across Australia, all have different but thematically aligned approaches to some of the ingredients for success when we're looking at changing the face of education across Australia and making sure that we expand, particularly in that mid-tier paraprofessional employment demand area um, and maximise the success of participants all round. So I will stop sharing my screen. If I can work out how to do that, pull up. No, no, that's fine. Um... Uh, Mish, oh, even even if you wanted to make one or two more points, um, but I was just going to um, give you a time call, so thank you. But That's also right. I've um, asked both Sharon and Ben, there were two questions, one to Sharon and one to Ben, um, because it's obvious we're going to run out of time. I was asking them if they wouldn't mind just answering them online. Um, the... Uh, the, the thing I guess that's interesting is that um, transitions are, are very complex and, and to me it kind of um, asks for a more individualised approach to students all, all round, which is um, a, a context in uh, the, it's the, that's the case in many other contexts as well. Um, so I might start to wrap up um, and if there are any more, I'll just double check there aren't any more questions. No, that's fabulous. Okay, so um, thank you everyone for participating and I'm sorry about the time um, Mish, that you um, probably you got cut short there a little bit. Um, thanks to all our speakers, all three speakers who've taken the time to participate in the session. Um, we really appreciate your insights. And we could have talked on this topic for much longer, I'm sure. Thank you um, for our sponsors. Um, e My Equals um, have sponsored today's event. So um, in starting to wrap up, we'd like to thank you all for attending, of course. TDA will be sending out a short survey in the coming days um, to ask for your valuable feedback. And, of course, um, we really appreciate people who do fill out those surveys because it means the next event is going to be even better. Um, recordings of the sessions will be available in November, although I note that the presentations some people are asking for from this session are already available and there's lots of great value in those slides, so I'd encourage you to look at them. Um, a quick add before we close, I'd like to remind you all that the TDA convention uh, 2024 will be in Sydney from the 8th to the 9th of May at the Sofitel Sydney Wentworth Hotel. Registrations and a call for proposals are open from Monday the 23rd. That's this Monday coming. And um, also remember that TDA's next one hour webinar, TAFE Talks, is on Wednesday, the 15th of November. It will address a really important issue at the heart of many tapes, which is how to maximise positive student um, experiences. Please go to the TDA website where you'll get more details for that and, and register. So that will bring our, um, our session to a close. Thank you all again for attending. Um, I've just seen some things in chat, so maybe I should double check. I know there's some nice um, praise there. Okay, no more questions. And um, I think if if we're all happy to leave, we can wrap it up there. Thank you so much for everyone.